Good evening. Uh, this being 701, 702, let's get started. Uh, my name is Robert Isinger. I'm a professor of political science here at Roger Williams. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Chris Aiken. But before I do a few brief announcements, uh, first I say it knowing that some of you know it already, please silence your phones, devices, contraptions, uh, GPSs, whatever we now call them. Uh, second, some logistics. After Chris concludes his talk, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. You see the microphones here. Uh, and that will be followed by a book signing outside. Here's the book. There's the book title. Uh, and it's wonderful. Uh, a special thanks go to several individuals who helped make this event happen. I cannot include all of them, but I think it's uh, worthy to include Kate Barash, Heidi Dagwan, and Joe Auger. Let's give them a round of applause. Fondly, my first days in graduate school at the University of Chicago, where Chris Aiken was then the chair of the political science department. Uh, I won't regale you with stories, but let's just say in a department full of bombastic personalities and healthy egos, Chris distinguished him, his, himself for his serenity and calm demeanor. Chris is a political junkie. Anybody who interacts with him knows that. And he speaks fondly and passionately, not just about political science, but about politics. Uh, within the discipline of political science, Chris is known for his work in political methodology. That is, how one studies politics and the methods used to derive meaningful answers to compelling puzzles. His early and current work on representation and survey responses remain the gold standards by which undergraduates, graduate students, and colleagues assess the challenges of accurately assessing political attitudes and beliefs. Chris Aiken is known for his clarity of thought, both in the classroom and in his written scholarship. He's also known for his dedication to his students, his, methodolog his methodological rigor, and his kindness. What is less known about Chris is his keen interest in the history of political science. Most specifically, how the pioneers within the discipline from the late 19th and early 20th century continue to shed light about how we can best explain political behavior and the evolution of political institutions. If you ask Chris a question, he may, in fact, refer you to Alexis de Tocqueville, James Bryce, Woodrow Wilson, Harold Gosnell, and some others. But beyond his insights as a political scientist, Chris remains one of the more decent people I've ever encountered in higher education. Chris has a coterie of students who remain his friend and have befriended him in large part because we've learned a lot from him. And we know that if we continue to stay friends with him, we will continue to grow as scholars and as citizens. Underlying his incredibly impressive CV, degree from Berkeley, Phi Beta Kappa, Magna Cum Laude, PhD from Yale, US Army Reserves, professional stints at Michigan, Chicago, and now at Princeton, is a love of life, a wonderfully wry sense of humor, a contagious laugh, and a thoroughly irrational affection for Michigan Wolverine football. Tonight's talk is appropriately titled, why elections produce unresponsive outcomes. Please join me in welcoming to Roger Williams, the Roger Williams Strauss Professor at Princeton University, Chris Aiken. Well, I knew Robert, uh, I've known Robert a long time, and I knew that the, uh, his introduction of me would be uh, entertaining and laudatory, and I, Sorry that my parents aren't still alive to hear it. Uh, my father would have enjoyed it, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> I, what I want to talk about today is this book that came out in the spring uh, with my colleague, uh, Larry Bartels, who's at Vanderbilt. And I thought I would begin by telling you one secret story about this book that uh, has never been told in, in public. And that story is this. While we were writing this book, I got interested in Rhode Island history in the colonial period. 
Now, I came up here on the train yesterday from New Jersey, and I did not need a passport when we left Connecticut and came into Rhode Island. But ladies and gentlemen, this was a near thing. Rhode Island did not want to join the union. It was the last state to join, and the people of the state were bitterly opposed to becoming part of the United States. If you look at the Federalist Papers, you will see that there are several references to Rhode Island. I have Clinton Rossiter's edited version of, of them, and uh, uh, Rossiter was a famous political scientist at, at Cornell a generation ago. And if you look in the, in the index, there are uh, four references to Rhode Island in the Federalist Papers. In two of those, Rhode Island is actually mentioned. In other cases, a description is given of how disastrous politics can be, even in a small place. And Rossiter is sure that that was Rhode Island that was, that was being mentioned. Well, <clears throat> I wanted to write about this several pages in this book. And Larry, exercising his customary good sense and, and wise judgment, said, well, we just can't go on at that length. The book is pretty long already. Um, you can write a sentence and a footnote, and uh, that'll be it. Because, you know, when is anyone ever going to have a chance to talk in Rhode Island about this subject? <laughs> Here I am. I have proven him wrong. So there is no Rhode Island reference in this, in this book, um, but it does appear on page 56 and it does discuss this very point. And it's relevant and not just a side issue because what happened in that, in that period and saved me from having to bring my passport yesterday was this. The elected leadership, that is to say the, the politicians widely despised by the American people in every, every state were the ones who got this done, got Rhode Island into the union. The people of the state, we didn't have polls in those days, and the, and the leadership of the state made sure there was no referendum because they were sure they were going to lose it. The people of the state didn't want to do it. And democracy left to itself at that point would have turned you into a little banana republic up here, uh, sandwiched between Connecticut and, and Massachusetts. That didn't happen. <clears throat> that didn't happen. But it was precisely because political leadership got it done and not because popular government got it done. Well, that's exactly the theme that I want to ad address today. So uh, it's, we didn't get Rhode Island into our index, but neither did the Federalist Papers. So uh, Rogue Island was how Rhode Island was referred to by the uh, people in the other states at that point. And it was, credit, it was clashes between debtors and creditors that were, that were, that were fundamental. And it, they just barely managed to get it to get it done. There may be people in the audience here who know a great deal about that period. So uh, that's, my, that's my remark about uh, Rhode Island. What about now? <clears throat> well, we have a story uh, now about uh, how democracy is supposed to work. And I want to bring to your attention how different that is from what the previous 20 centuries before the 18th, the way that they thought about political leadership and, and proper government. Democracy was not widely respected in that period. It was thought to be uh, the kind of disaster that uh, had been seen many times, where demagogues would promise crazy things and lie repeatedly, and the voters wouldn't care, and they'd vote for them anyway, and so forth. That was thought to be a standard feature of democracy. So if we had been meeting here 300 years ago, we would be in the middle of the forest, but uh, if, if we had tried to do that, and if I had said to you, you know, I think democracy in the end is probably the best form of government, you would have said, oh, a crazy wide-eyed radical with crackpot ideas. Uh, everyone knows that's not the case. What was thought to be sensible by thoughtful people, including professors and a great many other categories of people, was that the king had been appointed by God in, in one or another sense. And right-thinking people, including intellectuals, thought that point was beyond, beyond criticism. And they spent a lot of time congratulating themselves about being in the best of all possible political systems. 
and their failures and errors were swept under the rug. So the argument was always that the king was never wrong, because after all, he had been appointed by God. This applied to queens too, and couldn't be wrong, but he or she might have been badly advised. So there was a lot of discussion about the evil people around the king who was always uh, a, a, good, a, a good person. Now, we don't believe in divine right of kings anymore. We have a different divine ruler, and that's the people. So Robert Dahl, my teacher, a famous political scientist who wrote a great deal about democracy in his lifetime, passed away just recently in his 90s, <coughs> he argued that uh, a, a kind of classic statement of what Larry and I call the folk theory. This is the notion that ordinary people have policy ideas. They want to get those policy ideas enacted into law, have those policies carried out by the, by the government. And they look for candidates who agree with them, agree with the ideas that they have about this, about how the government should be run. When they find candidates who agree with them, they vote for them, and that's how we get responsive government. The people that are elected are people who have our ideas. And the reason they have them is we pick them on that, on that basis. And that was the idea that uh, Dahl promoted through his long career. This is from uh, early part of his career, but it, he continued in, in exactly this line. Well, as I say, we call that the folk theory. What is a folk theory? It's a theory that you can't actually find any experts to endorse in detail. Dahl himself didn't endorse this theory in complete detail. He qualified it in a variety of ways, and so does everybody else. So there is no, there is no author I can point to who has this exact idea of how democracy should work. It's, it is just something that appears in Fourth of July speeches. It also appears in campaign speeches. So when you listen to uh, the candidates for president this year, you heard this kind of logic all the time. Appeals to the innate goodness of the American people, and the government is corrupt and bad and not running well, but I will take your ideas and I will carry them out, and that's why my, you, should, you should vote for me. So we have the same theory, really, about the, the people that the people, that those who believed in the divine right of kings had, that is to say, as Rousseau put it in the 18th century, that people are never corrupted, but sometimes deceived. And we have our own set of um, people who, who uh, are thought to be the usual suspects for deceiving people, interest groups, sometimes political parties, corruptions of various kinds. Depending on your politics, the media uh, of uh, the side that you don't agree with, and so on and so forth. But people themselves are thought to be good, decent people who are, are never, uh, never misled, and those, I, uh, they, those ideas get elected into politics, in, into, into legislatures and the presidency. The problem with this is that <coughs> it's just not true. And we've known it's not true for more than 100 years. So if you read Graham Wallace in 1909, for example, he talks about how when you talk to real people, when you talk to actual voters, they don't have policy ideas. One of the things that happens when you walk a precinct is that you talk to real voters and you hear them out on exactly these, these kinds of topics. And the, and the things that are so dominant in the, in the media, so dominant in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and, and the little magazines of opinion from the National Review to the New, New Republic and so on, those make almost no impression in the life of ordinary people. They're busy. They've got sick grandparents. They've got little kids. They've got, they're working two jobs. They're, they're just plain busy. And a lot of other things are way more interesting and way more fun. Sports, for example, fa family, family life. And so uh, this uh, conversation that goes on, those of you who are political science majors, you're plugged in, and there is a group of people who are deeply, deeply involved in all of this stuff and can rehearse the entire presidential campaign, speech by speech and blunder by blunder. But that's not most people. Most people just aren't paying attention. And the developments that 
have occurred over the last 50 years that have been so impressive in so many ways. The internet, for example, when I get up in the morning, I can read the New York Times and the Washington Post and several other things in a, for free. Uh, and I just you know, erase my cookies every now and then so they never know how many I've read. Uh, and I can follow all kinds of things in a very inexpensive, very inexpensive way that was simply impossible 50 years ago. So information is available now cheap, cheaply in a way that it simply was not in a, a, a generation or, or two ago. And a lot of people infer from that that political information, political knowledge must have risen really dramatically. And the answer to that is it hasn't. The percentage of people who knew the name of their member of Congress in the 1950s was a half. The percentage of people who know the name of their member of Congress today is a half. And on a wide variety of other topics, the information level about politics just hasn't moved. And the simple fact is that the details of politics, as opposed to sex scandals and so forth, just aren't very, aren't very exciting to most, to most people. There is an enormous difference between the two presidential candidates this year on foreign policy. A dramatic <laughs> difference, sufficiently dramatic that a lot of uh, Republican foreign policy experts and intellectuals have endorsed Hillary Clinton. That's how far uh, Donald Trump is from, from the uh, American norms on this, on this score. But when you look at the survey research, look at the opinion polls, ask ordinary people, how do the foreign policy opinions of these two candidates differ? They simply don't know. That was true in the Democratic primary as well. Those two candidates uh, between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton were very different on foreign policy, and the, that went almost undiscussed. So in all these ways, we simply know that, whoops, wrong button. Um, we simply know that this just doesn't work. Now, the irony here is that none of, we know all this, but it doesn't make an impression on us. So George Gallup wrote a book in 1940 called The Pulse of Democracy, in which he said, polling is going to be great. We can find out what the voters think, and the government can just do that. And that is the folk theory of democracy in a very straightforward way. Nothing about leadership, nothing about uh, having more information on the part of, of the people who work full-time in politics, just enact into law uh, what it is that ordinary voters are thinking. Now, <clears throat> if you think that the polling business works like that, that it simply reflects what ordinary voters think, then Robert Isinger's book, The Evolution of Presidential Polling, is a great place to look. The politicians and the pollsters have been tangled up with each other for uh, many decades, and the matter is a lot more complex than, than um, Mr. Gallup, or more recently, Frank Newport, who works for Gallup, uh, would, would have you believe. Now, <clears throat> you may say <clears throat> one of the chapters in our book is called, actually, it's called, it, it feels like we're thinking, of course, horrible grammar, but it feels as if we were thinking, it has no ring to it at all. So I put the grammatical thing up here today, but that's not what the chapter is called. This is, this is a little graph here that shows you opinion about the budget deficit in the Clinton years. So if, if you think back, uh, those of you who are old enough to remember that period, the deficit, the federal budget deficit that Clinton inherited was quite substantial in 1993 when he took office. By the end of his term, combination of the tax increase that uh, George H.W. Bush had negotiated at the end of his term and the one that Clinton put into place had eliminated the budget deficit. The economy was roaring. Everybody was working. And so the question was then, in, in 1996, when Clinton was up for re-election, the question to ordinary voters was, what's happened to the budget deficit since Clinton took office? This was an intensely discussed issue at the time. It was in the headlines of all the newspapers. The internet was a little young at that point, but it was all over the internet too. What did people say when asked? Now, this is work done by the University of Michigan, the American National Election Study, very famous, long-running 
series of surveys in presidential and midterm years. And the, uh, the vertical axis here, the y-axis, ranges from 50 to, to minus 50. 50 is the response. It, the deficit has improved a lot. <coughs> minus 50 is, it's gotten a lot worse. So this line here that, um, if I can get it to show, this line is the average response of Democrats as a function of how much information they knew. So we ask, we ask people political information questions. How many justices of the Supreme Court are there? Who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Which party has the majority in the House of Representatives? Questions of that kind that are easy for people who follow politics closely and hard for, for people who don't. So we grouped people into percentiles here. So uh, this it works exactly like your SAT scores did, right? 90th percentile means 90% of the people know less than you do, 10% of the people know more. So there's an e there are an equal number of people at each of these at e each of these points, and we simply look at them by party. So in this group, these are the Democrats, up to the 70th percentile, the average response they're giving is zero. That means the economy, the budget deficit hasn't gotten either better or worse. They simply have no idea, right? And that's up to almost three quarters of the population. They, they just, uh, among Democrats, they simply have no idea. And it's only in the upper 30% uh, and really dramatically only in the last 10 or 15% that you start to get responses that are close to the truth, which is a dramatic change for the better in, in the budget deficit. The situation among Republicans, on the other hand, is different. At the low end of information, they look just like the, they look just like the Democrats. They know probably that the deficit's always getting bad. They don't exactly know whether the re president is responsible for it or not. <laughs> they may be a little vague about what a deficit is. They, they give an average response of zero. But as they start to get a little more information here among Republicans, they move to an average response that the deficit has gotten uh, worse, somewhat worse. How could anyone think the deficit had gotten worse in that period? We believe that the mental process they go through is this. They don't actually know what's happened to the deficit. But they do know that the president has responsibility for it. They do know that Clinton is in office. They do know that Clinton is a Democrat. And they know that Democrats are no good. So it must have gotten worse. So in this intermediate, in this intermediate stretch, on an issue of that was, you know, really central. It was then what immigration is now, very, very much central to the to the debates. Republicans are are on the wrong side, and as it, and you have to go fairly far up among Republicans just to get to uh, where they say, well, it may be neither better nor worse. And only at the really high ends of information are they prepared to concede that maybe Clinton has made some, some helpful difference. Now, if you're a Democrat sitting there saying to yourself, uh, I knew those Republicans were confused, let me just tell you that if I had put up the same graph for whether Ronald Reagan had improved inflation in his period in office, which he did dramatically, just as dramatically as Clinton improved the budget deficit, the graph would be exactly the same, except that the two parties would be reversed. That is to say, it was the Democrats who were lying to themselves in, 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 that, in that period. So this graph isn't about Republicans, it's about people, and about how little, we, how little attention we, we pay. Now, <clears throat> professional political scientists mostly defend democracy in a, in a different way. And we defend it with something called the retrospective theory of voting. And I'm going to skip through some of this just in the interests of time. But the idea simply is that, yeah, the voters don't follow things in detail. But it's OK, because they can tell good from bad, right? They can tell whether things are going all right. So they can pick a candidate or pick a government in the same way that you pick a dentist. You have a toothache, you go to the dentist, the, he or she does something to you, and you 
decide whether or not you're getting better. And if you're not getting better, you change dentists. And if you are getting better, you reelect the incumbent. So that's the argument. And Morris Fiorina at Stanford has made a lot of this and has, has said things like that that summarize exactly what I just said. If jobs have been lost in a recession, something's wrong, and so forth. Now, there's much to this. <laughs> One of the things that surprises people who come to political science for the first time is, as James Carville famously put it in 1992 during that election campaign, it's the economy, stupid. And what this is, is a graph of the state of the economy in each of the, oops, sorry about that, each of these years. Got it. In each of these years, uh, the growth in real disposable income per capita in the uh, spring and summer of the year before the election. And these numbers here on the horizontal axis are the percentage growth, the annual percentage rate of growth. And you can see we've had some years where uh, growth rates were negative and some in which they were uh, substantially positive. But we simply plot that against the vote for the incumbent. This is adjusted for the fact that when a party's been in office for a while, people are inclined to vote against them. So right now, the Democrats have been in office for eight years. That gives the Republicans an advantage in a year like this one. And with any good sense in the primaries, they would be winning. They're not winning, uh, says something. But what this tells you is that if you, all you know is the state of the economy in a given year, you can do a terrifically good job of, of predicting who is going to be elected. There's some deviation off the line. That's because uh, wars come along. Some candidates are better than others. But to a pretty good, to a pretty good basis, uh, you can predict. That's retrospective voting, right? People just say, how's the economy been doing lately? If it's good, they reelect the incumbent. If it's bad, they don't. So there's a lot to this retrospective theory. But for it to make sense as a defense of democracy, the voters have to know whether it's the government's fault that's happened. So this is a long story, and I'm glad to go into it more in the, in the question period. But I want to give you just one example. In 1916, in New Jersey, there were shark attacks along the shore. <laughs> Four people died. Two of these shark attacks were uh, in beach towns, uh, the so-called Jersey Shore towns, and the summer was ruined. People used this as an argument against Wilson. He had cabinet meetings to deal with this. He sent Coast Guard cutters up and down to try to, try to kill the sharks. And the whole thing worked in exactly the way that the Jaws movies, uh, if you've seen those, and the, there's a novel too, actually, by Peter Benchley, who lived in, who lived in Princeton, uh, and knew about the 1916 shark attacks in New Jersey. There's actually a brief reference to, the, to those attacks. But, they, but the Jaws movies recapitulate in great detail what happened in New Jersey in 1916. Denial that there were sharks trying to keep the news away from the summer people and all that sort of thing. So here's where the sharks were. This is a little map here. And the shark apparently was, if it was just one shark, no one knows for sure, apparently swimming north, further north than usual, attacked in this little town of Beach Haven, and then again up here in Spring Lake. So you can see that this is just, there's Princeton. It's just not very far. It's less than an hour's drive down to these places. And you can stand there on the shore now and watch the people in the water in their swimsuits and think about 1916. That, uh, we studied this, uh, those shark attacks. And they reduced the vote for Princeton, for uh, Woodrow Wilson. I said Princeton because he was a former member of my department before he became president. Uh, it reduced the vote for Wilson in the fall by about 10 percentage points in, in that part of the state. So people voted against the incumbent because there were shark attacks. And <clears throat> that's not the only kind of voting against the incumbent that people do. So agricultural states depend on rain. And you can look back over the last 100 years and see um, whether states were too wet or too dry. We've done that. We estimate that close to 3 million people voted 
against Al Gore. Again, the Democrats were the incumbent, incumbents then because their states were, were too wet or too dry. He lost seven, we think, about seven states because of that, of course, more than enough to keep him from, from, being, um, from being president. Now, you might say, well, but a lot of this is rational, right? So in the Depression, people voted to get rid of Her Herbert Hoover. He didn't want to do anything about the economy. Franklin Roosevelt did. That's, that's perfectly good rationality. But it turns out that across Europe, people just threw out the incumbents when the, in, when the dep depression hit. They threw out socialist governments if the socialists were in power. They threw out right-wing conservative governments if the conservatives were in power. They threw out middle-of-the-road governments if they were in power. People simply voted against the incumbents because time was hard. It didn't have anything to do with whether they were going to be better or, off, better or worse off after it happened. So in, in summary here, um, this is, I'm going to skip a little bit of this. Um, in summary, we think that people do, did this then and do it now. This is uh, polling data from 2008. The uh, bluish line there is the percentage of people favoring Obama. The reddish line is the percent favoring McCain. And you can see that McCain was doing quite well in the first part of September, and then the Great Recession started, uh, banks and finance companies started to fail, and Obama was, Obama was elected. So if this is the way the voters think, it's hard to make this the foundation of democracy either. So I'm gonna, that's about um, Alberta, and I'm skipping over the Canadian, uh, Canadian case because it's common for Americans to do that, but I'm glad to. <laughs> glad to discuss it in the, in, uh, in the question period. And uh, it, these effects are often long lasting. So the Republicans were the majority party before Franklin Roosevelt. The Depression came along, and the Democrats were the majority party for more than a generation after that. So we argue that these effects and the way the voters think about voting, uh, the retrospective effects, are not only unrelated to what the government is doing frequently, but they have powerful long-term long -term effects that, that uh, turn the tide in elections for a full generation afterwards. All of this, um, me, that's more Alberta there, um, all of this means that um, we can't think about democracy with the folk theory, and we can't think about it with the retrospective theory of voting. That simply doesn't, simply doesn't work. So <clears throat> this is, so the alternative that we turn to frequently in places where there are referendums and initiatives is just to have people themselves decide or to give, or to give their elected officials very short terms of office. So it was quite common in the colonial period in this country to give governors one-year terms. And that was to keep them on a short leash. So they were constantly uh, campaigning for office and had to do exactly what people wanted done, even if, even if it was just a short-term uh, preference on the part of the voters. This is support for fluoridation. Fluoridation uh, is not a hot issue anymore. It's kind of died down, but it was hot in the 50s and 60s. This was the process of adding uh, compounds of, of fluorine to, gas, uh, to uh, water because that uh, helps reduce the number of cavities that, that kids get. I grew up in a town that um, uh, believed that fluoridation was a communist conspiracy, and I have uh, many thousands of dollars of dental bills to show for, for it. This is, this is support for fluoridation by mayors. This was a survey that was done in the, in the 50s, not by us. These are, sorry, I hit the wrong button again. These are, um, Mayors with very short terms with one-year terms. These are two to three-year terms. And these are mayors with four to five-year terms. And you can see that the safer the person is in office and the more insulated they are from popular pressures, the more likely they are to do the, to do the right thing. It's precisely when they have to do what the voters um, want done in the short run that they harm their children. A, a more dramatic instance of this is the 1991 Oakland Hills firestorm. 
uh, which killed 25 people and, and devastated about 3,000 homes. The Federal Emergency Management Agency found that it was Proposition 13, <coughs> the, the uh, voter-approved initiative that cut taxes, that was primarily responsible for the inability to respond to the, to the thing. And as far as we can tell, the voting data aren't quite right on top of the fire air area, but it looks as if the people in those areas that were where the fire took place had voted about uh, three to one in favor of the tax cutting initiative. In other words, by a three to one majority, they voted to burn their homes down. Now, <clears throat> this way of thinking tells you not that the voters are always wrong, because they're not. Often, elites are wrong, too. But what it tells you is that an exclusive reliance on just one of those groups is a mistake. So just as cutting the voters out of the policy process entirely, which is the way the divine right of kings worked, that's a mistake, so also is turning over policy decisions just to the voters. And we have a system now for, uh, in many states, for making policy decisions by just having the voters make those decisions themselves, and they make a lot of, make a lot of mistakes. Our primary uh, selection of presidential candidates just in my lifetime has gone from one in which people who actually know the candidates had some voice in the selection process. We have now turned it over entirely to um, ordinary people on, on both sides. This is particularly relevant uh, on the dispute about superdelegates, which um, you know, both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump talked about a, a good deal, and they talked about how it's undemocratic to have, to have superdelegates. That that's folk theory thinking, and it seems to, us, um, seems to us a mistake. How do people, how do people actually make decisions in the voting booth? We think it's identities. That is to say, social identities, religious identities, professional identities, gender identities, uh, all kinds of identities, that, uh, which we all have, often many identities. And it's those that are fundamental. <coughs> now, we, uh, when last spring when our book came out, we hired Donald Trump to help us make this point. And he's done a wonderful publicity job for us. But his, it's particularly clear in his case, I think, that his support comes from people with a certain identity. It's an older, uh, heavily white group of people with strong views about the country. Uh, being American is important to their identity, and they have a feeling that they have been mistreated by the system, and that's, that's part of their identity as well. Again, if you're a Democrat congratulating yourself that you don't do this kind of thing, I suggest that you're quite mistaken. These forces are just as strong on the Democratic side as they are on the Republican side. Clinton is getting strong support from um, minorities, and those, are, again, are often strong identities uh, for people. There's also a huge gender gap this year, and those gender identities are an important part of what distinguishes these two candidates. What we argue, though, is that policy views are not crucial, and the example I keep Referring to is Donald Trump's proposal to build a wall across the boundary with Mexico. His voters agree with that. So if you survey them and say, do you think we should build a wall across Mexico? They say yes. And if you say, does Donald Trump support that? They say yes. And it looks like a great victory for the folk theory of democracy. People have preferences. They find a candidate with those preferences. And they vote for that person. Of course, it doesn't work like that at all, right? They developed their preference for building a wall across Mexico uh, because he proposed it. And over and over and over again, in more subtle cases that are harder to, that are harder to talk about uh, simply, but which political scientists have investigated in great detail for 50 years, that's what's going on, just as much on the Democratic side as on the Republican side. Uh, if you <coughs> watch uh, MSNBC in the mornings, as my wife does, you'd be hard-pressed to know that Hillary Clinton has had any troubles with her email servers uh, or uh, a lot of other challenges that's, that she has faced. And much the same is true uh, about 
Fox News and the challenges that Republicans have, have faced. So these identities affect not only uh, how you vote and the ideas you adopt, but they even affect, to some degree, your judgment of what the facts are, as we saw in the case of the, of the budget deficit in the, in, the, in the Clinton years. So there's a lot of intellectual history here from the 19th century that we have lost. We want to, we want to revive it. So I want to give just a couple of examples here, and then I'll um, fall silent, um, of examples in which identities are, uh, are, are powerful and, and important. This is Catholic support for Democrats from the period of 1952 to 2008. You can see there's just one huge jump there in 1960. That's that's John Kennedy running for president, right? This couldn't matter less anymore, right? John Kerry was Catholic. The only people who made an issue of his Catholicism in that race were the Catholic bishops. They were mad at him because he wasn't adhering to Catholic doctrine. Nobody else cared. But that identity effect in that year not only raised support for the Democrats among Catholics, you can see Rhode Island just jumping right off the line at that point because this is the most Catholic state in the country. But Protestants, particularly in the South, went in the other direction. People who'd never voted for a Republican in their life voted for Richard Nixon because they couldn't abide the thought that the Pope was going to be sailing on a barge up the Potomac and taking over the White House. You laugh, but I remember. Uh, <clears throat> what, about, um, what about a case that everyone thinks must be an exception? So this. As we all know, one of the big realignments that's taken place in American politics has been the South. From being the solid South for uh, about 100 years, always voting for the Democrats, it has now become reliably Republican. And you might say to yourself, well, we know why that is. It's because once black people started to vote in the South, that, and they were Democrats, that drove Republicans into the into the Republican, uh, sorry, that drove uh, white Democrats into the Republican Party on grounds of uh, racial conservatism. Not exactly. This is the change in the uh, margin, that is to say, the difference between how many people are Democrats and how many people are Republicans in, among white Southerners over the period from 1960 to 2000. As you can see, there's two lines here, which I'll explain in a minute, show that that proportion is dropping pretty steadily in the South. That is to say, white Southerners are becoming Republican, as we all know. What's not so obvious in this line is that the darker one is racially conservative white Southerners, and the lighter one is racially liberal white Southerners. And as you can see, the racially conservative ones drop a little more, but they're both plummeting. It isn't policy, right? It's identity. And being a white Southerner who is a Democrat has become more and more and more difficult. We're not alone in this. Other people have looked at this and said, geez, this can't be true, but it looks like it is. It's not really race. The last example I'm going to give here is <coughs> about abortion. Uh, we have a long-running study in political science. These are people my age, uh, exactly my age, who were interviewed when they were high school juniors and they've been interviewed four times. So we can look at people in 1980, who were interviewed in 1982. And these are uh, people in this graph. These are all people in 1982 who said they were Republicans. And we know their, op their opinion on abortion in 1982 because we asked them. And these are conservative people on abortion. These are people who th say abortion is sometimes necessary. These are people who say that abortion should always be permitted. Right? And so the, this, the height of these curves tell you how many of those people stuck with the Republican Party. The upper graph is men, and the lower one is women. You can see that people who were conservative on abortion in 1982 practically all stuck with the Republican Party until 1997. Uh, both men and women didn't make any difference. But as they became more liberal on uh, abortion policy, it didn't, the men didn't care, right? There's a little drop, but there's not much of an effect. 
the women plunge. In fact, this number is just above 50%. That is to say, women who were liberal on abortion in, um, in uh, 1982, about half, these are white women, they were about half gone by the year 1997, in a 15-year period, about half of white women with liberal abortion views left the, left the Republican Party. And that's a, lot of, that's a large part of the realignment. Why not men? They don't care, right? It's just not as central an issue for them. This is a similar one where we look at people who uh, were pro-life in 1982. That's a comfortable majority, actually. And we look at what happened to them by 1997, their abortion views by party. So over here on this side, these are the Republicans. And they were pro-life in 1982, and they're mostly still pro-life in 1997. Over here, the Democrats are, um, who were pro-life in 82 have mostly converted to being, um, uh, to, to being pro-choice. Who has really converted? The women, not so much, right? The men, the men converted a lot more. What do these two things tell you? Women care much more about abortion than men do. When they find themselves in a clash between their party's views and their views, they mostly just change their views to accord with their party. When women find themselves in a clash between those two things, they dump their party because right? it's much more central to them. So there are two competing identities here. And one of them is a gender identity, and the other one is a partisan identity. And you can see what, it, what difference that, that makes. So we argue then that uh, these identities predict and that they are central to, to politics. We think we ought to spend more time thinking about that. And we think that the romantic interpretation uh, of uh, the folk theory isn't the right way to think about politics. This has all kinds of consequences. So you'll find occasionally people who think that the Germans were anti-Semitic and that's why they elected Hitler. That's folk theory thinking again. Historians who've looked at it think that exactly the opposite was true. They were anti-Semitic because they were for Hitler. They weren't for Hitler because they were anti-Semitic. Last graph, party. This is, this is, um, this is how liberal your member of Congress is as a function of how liberal the constituency is. And you can see here that among, the scale here is conservative at the top and liberal at the bottom. Among Republicans, the red dots, they're all pretty conservative. <coughs> when the constituency gets a little, more, uh, a little more conservative, they get a little more conservative too, but not much. Among Democrats, exactly the same thing. They're down here toward the left because they're more liberal. They don't respond much to their constituencies either. Again, that tells you the folk theory doesn't work, right? Mostly, Democrats are Democrats and Republicans are Republicans. And how liberal or conservative the constituency is doesn't, doesn't make much difference. Well, there are lots of good things about democracy. Uh, and we can talk more about that. I want to halt here. But what I really want to say to you is that in the Federalist Papers, in the ideas of the founders, this was a republic and not a, de not a democracy. Republican, capital R, Republican conservatives often say that. Um, but they have a hard time sticking to it, just as, the, just as the Democrats do. Leadership matters. To say it would be more democratic to get rid of the superdelegates, for example, it's not an intellectually serious argument. And thinking more about the um, balance of um, popular views with the opinions of the professional politicians is really what we need to think more about. Um, and I'll skip this, I think. Um, so I think that what political science needs to be more centrally about and what the thinking of uh, educated and informed members of the citizenry needs to be about is thinking about candidates and their voters as coalitions of groups, coalitions of identity groups, as well as issue networks. And issue networks are how those groups come to have certain policy views. Um, 
this whole package, the fact that we mostly do what we're told and we mostly think what we're told, means that there are huge imbalances in, in power uh, in, in the current system. So America is a democracy, but it's not very democratic. Talking about the divine right of people to rule is, we argue, bad science. And it has real consequences that sometimes go as far as uh, burning your home down. OK, uh, that's it. And I welcome your questions. Uh, yeah, uh, if we could have the first two questions come from a student, that would be great. Um, does this work? Uh, I'll just Good. talk. I'll just, I can also talk loud. Okay. I think it's on. Okay, um, so you talk about the divine right for people to rule, and obviously looking at it from the Platonic view, that's the whole thing he discusses in the Republic, so I'm kind of just wondering what you're feeling on his whole unjust regime thing is in relation to how it plays out now today. Um, that's uh, a very large topic, as uh, I'm sure you knew. Yeah. Um, it is interesting to read Plato and Aristotle now because so much of what we are saying here was was quite familiar to them, and, and more familiar than it is to most of us getting an education in high school civics class, for, for example. Their description of, what, of the problems of uh, democracy with uh, demagogues, for example, which I referred to earlier, uh, is, you know, describes Huey Long perfectly, or Joe McCarthy perfectly, um, maybe other people too. Um, and, so their, their focus is on, um, as I think a lot of Americans really, uh, really is, um, on getting good government, right? Getting, and, and not necessarily doing exactly what we want them to do. So um, I was talking to a man once from my parents' generation, and just an ordinary person, not an educated person. And he said to me, Franklin Roosevelt knew the war was coming. And he knew we were going to have to fight it. We didn't want to fight it. He lied to us about how we weren't going to fight it. He, meantime, prepared for that war. He, but he lied and lied and lied until Pearl Harbor. And he said he was a great president. So there is some sense on people's part that, that leadership and the right answer is what's central. Well, that's Plato, right? Plato's not about popular responsiveness. Uh, he's, he's about just government and right outcomes. And I think a little harder thought about that on our part would be, would be helpful in the current climate. Here's a question. Hi there. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, this election, of course, it's seeming in many regards that the populism that Donald Trump's really brought forth is kind of like reconnaissance of like the whole 1972 election, um, just in regards to, you know, where um, the party leaders, you know, the, their chosen candidate has really been somewhat of a, it, it fell through completely for them. Um, do you see essentially any ability for the Republican Party to come back after this election? Um, and also just in regards to um, term limits as well, because you were discussing how um, with those one year term limits, there is a lot of pressure and uh, political leaders weren't actually able to do their jobs. Um, do you see the term limits as being something, just a, a populist you know, sort of request um, you know, that's not going to happen anytime soon? Or do you think um, that it's, there's something more to that as well? Uh, those are two good questions. Let me take the um, term limits thing first, because we actually talk about those in the book. And I, I think the upshot of t term limits sound good to people, uh, get, get a less professional legislature and so on, fresh blood. There is a fair amount of research on this now. And what happens is that when you have term limits, you get amateurs uh, in, in office, and they are easily suckered by the interest groups. So voting for term limits is really voting to have 
the interest groups in, in charge rather, rather than the legislature. Uh, and you know, we don't do this in other aspects of our lives. You don't, you don't say to yourself, geez, this, you know, this surgeon, uh, he's been in there six years. I think I should get a younger one. <laughs> uh, this airline pilot, you know, he's been flying 10 years. I think I should get one just out of flight school. We don't think that way in other aspects of life. And I think the reason we don't is that we don't think of uh, politicians as a professional class, as knowing something. That's a serious mistake. Right? That's a serious mistake. Um, on the other question, I think that I think that the future of the Republican Party is a, just extremely interesting at the at the moment. We were talking about this at, at dinner. The challenges there, you know, there are three pieces basically to the Republican Party. There's there are the there's the business interests, the evangelicals and other Christian conservatives, and then the Tea Party slash Donald Trump people. And that's too simple in a variety of ways, but you get the drift of what I'm trying to say. The business people and the evangelicals had worked out how to live together, <laughs> but nobody has worked out how to live together with the Tea Party. And <laughs> so will it evolve uh, or will they, will they split? Will we have a third party movement? Uh, the Republicans split in the first part of the 20th century. We had three-way races for, for president in, in uh, 1912 and 1924, for example. That was a Republican Party split uh, to sort that out. I think that's a, that's a possibility. Um, the other possibility is uh, that the Trump people are um, old and a few elections, and there are fewer and fewer of them all the time. Uh, young people don't want to go in that direction on, on, if they're Republicans. That's another possible outcome. I would be misleading you if I said I had any idea what the, how that's going to play out. I don't think anyone does. Uh, I'd be curious to know your opinion on uh, the Electoral College as opposed to the popular vote, which does not, in fact, uh, decide the outcome of elections. Right. And in recent times, that's been the case. Um, what in your in your opinion, should the Electoral College be abolished? <coughs> should popular vote decide? <coughs> I find that when I'm talking on the coast, there's great enthusiasm for abolishing the Electoral College. When I'm talking in the center of the country in the little states, there isn't. <coughs> um, I'm from Montana originally. It's a little state. And I listen a lot to coastal people talking about the flyover states and how they're totally irrelevant and should be ignored and so on. And <clears throat> that reminds me of the Constitutional Convention and the provisions that were put in, the United States Senate being the obvious one, but the Electoral College being the other one, to, because it is a federal system and because the states do have legal sovereignty, limited, uh, but nevertheless sovereignty, <laughs> that we have, we have provisions in place so that the big, powerful states can't just do whatever they want. This isn't what I thought when I was young. Um, and there are two good sides to the argument, but I guess I lean a little toward the Senate and the Electoral College. More questions? I'll walk to you. You can shout, Cuba. Shout away, and then I'll give you the mic. Um, well, first off, I, I do agree with the, the point that politicians do need to be considered as a profession. Um, but I was intrigued by the graph that posits the idea that the, the more secure the a mayor was in their term, the better decisions that they would objectively make. So how do you contrast that to a Congress where many of the representatives are essentially guaranteed incumbency um, simply because of the nature of, of whether it be their finances or the electorate? So, so how, do you, I don't know, how do you draw a line from the mayoral ar argument to a Congress that is gridlocked and when not gridlocked, ineffective? 
Robert, don't you have any students here who could ask simple questions? Yeah, why don't you make, why don't you, you got to defend the uh, non-competitive district as a reason for good government, buddy. The, the issue that you raise is an important one, uh, obviously, just as the previous questions raised here were uh, hard and important. The, I think the issue is partly this. You can't, um, when I was your age, the states were gerrymandered. So it would often be the case that 25% that, um, uh, of the voters could elect a majority of the legislature. Um, and the Supreme Court struck that down in the 60s. The Warren Court did. They explicitly excluded themselves, however, from going into partisan gerrymanders. And I, I guess my view is we've, at some point, they need to go into partisan gerrymanders because the legislatures, just as they wouldn't reform themselves then, aren't going to reform themselves now. And you do have this situation in which, uh, in the House, in this election, for example, it's a handful of it's a handful of seats that are competitive. If the Democratic sweep on election night is at the high end of the polls, uh, we might get a change of 50 or 60 seats. But it's not going to be 100, as it would have been a century ago. And it is precisely for the reason you raised that, that this happens. And I think it has two consequences. One is that these people are uh, essentially in office forever and cemented in. But the other consequence is that their only challenge comes from the, in the primary. And that means that in both parties, the, the people that are out to the wings uh, pull, pull the incumbents further out. And, you know, in, we have a lot of data on this now, but the, in both parties in Congress now, the number of moderates is really quite small. Um, I was um, in, in college, uh, I was Tom Foley's first college summer intern, a guy who eventually became Speaker of the, of the House, but he was just newly elected. And um, I got to know him a little then and kept in touch somewhat over the years. And I was invited to his memorial service at the Capitol a year ago, which was a real honor for me. But uh, Bob Michael spoke, who was the minority leader in the time when Foley was, was um, speaker. And Michael talked about how, uh, you know, this Democrat and this Republican would meet each week uh, together, talk about the things that the two parties could agree on, say, yeah, we're going to yell about this, but actually uh, we can live with it, and so on. And they would work out something acceptable, and the result would be, you know, good government. That's that doesn't happen anymore. And that's a problem, I think. The Constitution just doesn't, isn't designed to work well with, with parties that, that polarized. And I do think that a lot of people disagree with this. I'm in the minority. But I do think that redistricting is part of the problem. A couple more questions. Yeah. Back here. So theories on the social contracts were a highlight of the Enlightenment period. I was just wondering, do you believe that theories of the social contract is still relevant in today's society, or do you think we've progressed to believe in a more relevant theory of political thinking? Yeah, that's a hard another, another softball. <laughs> yeah, that's one after another here. Um, I'll be glad to get to bed tonight. Um, um, <laughs> There is, for the political theorists in the room, this is not going to be up to speed, but I'll, I'll do the best that I can. There, there is an element of social contract in being a member of a democratic society, right? You do, you do uh, commit yourself to certain norms, certain values. You, you do not say, for example, it'll be great if we win the election, but if not, I will have the military take over the country. And, and things like that. So there, there, is a, there is a kind of implicit agreement that we're all um, under, that certain, certain norms are going to be upheld. Um, 
uh, certain norms that are, I think, you know, have become violated all too often lately. Norms of civility and and listening to the other side and not assuming that that they're evil or or stupid. Um, and and so th in that sense, I think I think that aspect of the social contract is 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 very relevant. If you're referring specifically to Rousseau's version of the social contract, that, for me, doesn't work anymore. And that's maybe a longer discussion than, than you want from me right now. But I'd, I'd be glad to chat afterwards if you want to pursue it. Who wants the last question? No, I'm not. I, I had a, when I was teaching this at an early stage, I was teaching this course um, at the University of Michigan, a, 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 an early version of, of, of some of this. And uh, I had a student come to me late in the semester, and she said, um, I want to make sure I understand the argument uh, that you're making. I said, well, why don't you kind of summarize, and I'll see. She laid it all out. I said, I think you've got it. She said, this is really depressing. I said, now I'm sure you've got it. Uh, and there is, I, I don't hold, there are people who think that uh, procedures for deliberative democracy, where we'd sit in a room and talk to each other and so forth, that that would make a difference. I'm skeptical about people wanting to go to those meetings. Most, most people don't want politics to be like a philosophy seminar. Um, so uh, my own goal here, or my own view here, I should say, is that um, <clears throat> we have to stop lying to ourselves about you know, human, human nature. Um, when, we've written, we've, when, when we've done things like this for, an, we did an op-ed this summer, um, and uh, you know, we got feedback. And some of the email feedback was, yes, the other candidates are motivated by these uh, group loyalties. We, however, are, have only justice and rationality in su supporting our candidate. Uh, so get, it, it's easy enough to see this stuff in other people. It's, the challenge is to see it in yourself. I'm more inclined to think that that's not going to happen um, and that we need institutions that balance, uh, as James Madison, also a product of my department, um, although not lately, um, uh, said that it's, it's putting countervailing forces in place so that no one of us gets to have our own little biases and prejudices operative. And that out of that process of having to deal with, with other power centers, you, are, you get closer to something reasonable because you don't get to control it all yourself. What's, what's hard about this is that that's exactly what people don't like. You know, they want a strong leader who will do what's right, meaning what I want. That's not democracy. Democracy is about compromise, and that's exactly how the Constitution is written. On that sobering note, let's give a big hand for Chris Aiken. There, there remain opportunities to continue the Q&A solo and there's a book signing outside if you have more questions so continue the dialogue and conversation outside